Father, give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation that I might know you. Lord, open the eyes of my heart that I truly might see you, O God. Not the way the world has told me. The way your spirit reveals. Then I will truly be able to worship you in spirit and truth. Touch my eyes, O God, that I might see you. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Are we ready? Do you remember last Sunday's message? Do you remember last Sunday's message? What did we look at last Sunday? The woman who was brought to Jesus. Remember? And the crowd of onlookers around. Let's go to John chapter 8 and quickly read that verses. Jesus was up in the Mount of Olives praying to his father. Comes down. The Pharisees catch a woman. They bring her to him. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. Please take that carefully. Okay. What did he do? He? Yeah, but that's okay. He was, he was always seated in his father's perfect will. But what did he do? That was major part of Jesus' ministry was teaching the people. So wherever the word is being taught, please be there. And then the scribes and the Pharisees brought him to, to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. And Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's what we looked. We looked last Sunday as to how we were all part of that crowd. Either as part of the accused or part of the accusers or probably both. One place, every man, woman and child will run, want, reach one place through different roads. What is that? To the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Everybody will reach. But if you reach that seat now, when you are alive, what does Jesus say? I do not condemn you. I do not judge you. Go. You get a fresh chance. His mercies are new, even today. Doesn't matter how we have come into this house today. The mercy is there, fresh, new. He says, I do not condemn you. Go, deal with what? Your past. Do not sin again. And it's very important that we start taking the messages seriously. I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 25 to 29. And we continue on that one verse. Go, do not sin. Therefore also, we also, see you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, how much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven? This is talking about those who heard from Moses and now us who hears from Jesus. And whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised saying, yet once more I shake not only the earth but also the heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. God is saying something. He says once more, before the end comes, He will shake everything. 
And we are seeing the shaking taking place across the globe. There is confusion, there is panic, there is fear. All governments and leaders are trying to do everything. There are so explanations given, but there is no solution. There is no solution going to come for the turmoil that is happening. It will only get worse as days pass by. Otherwise, you will have to rewrite this book. Because God is going to shake everything. But let me tell you, there is another shaking that is allowing it to happen. That is in the lives of his children. He will allow everything in us to be shaken. And will only allow those things that are built on truth. The rock. To be left standing. Everything. Doesn't matter how sacred you may think it is. He will allow it to be shaken. If your marriage, your job, your home, or your children, your relationship with them, your health, whatever you have in your life, it will all will be shaken. Praise God. Why? Because if your marriage is built on a lie, He will shake it. Not to destroy it, but to restore it. But if you do not react to that shaking the way He wants to, your marriage will be destroyed. If a job is built on a lie, certificates which you never earned, marks which you really never studied for, are you getting it? Experience which you never had but shown in pieces of paper, it will be shaken. That's what a lot of people do in today's sector. It's very easy to produce certificates, degree certificates when you never went to college. I had a friend in college, the only time he entered the class was when it was raining outside. Yet he also has a degree. God says it will all be shaken, everything will be shaken because he loves us. If your relationship with one another is built on a lie as a parent to a child, as a child to a parent, everything finally has to be built on truth because when it is shaken, it's not only the earth, the heavens and the earth, everything is going to be shaken. Everything is going to be shaken. So that when the judgment comes, we will not be caught in the judgment. So be very, very careful. Whatever we are building is built on the truth. You have to identify the source and you have to define the purpose. The reason is, God says, fulfill that purpose, you will walk away a victor. So we will all end up at the feet of Jesus like this woman. Torn of everything that was false. Till that day, nobody knew who this woman was. We do not know how long she was living like that. But that day, because she did not deal with it when it could have been dealt privately, God says, let me deal with it publicly. But even when I deal with it publicly, it is not to condemn. It is to give you another chance. So, this is the day God is saying, deal today, now. So we looked last week about how that woman reached that stage, different stages. Nobody reaches in one day in a situation like that. There are stages, remember? We are not going to look at that now. So we all have come to different stages in our journey in sin or in obedience. Some have come as an accused, some has come as the accusers of the brethren. But the judgment is in the hands of the Lamb of God. He is still today the Lamb of God. He hasn't come yet as the Lion of Judah. When he comes as the Lion of Judah, it is judgment. So he tells us even today, go, sin no more. I think they are going to love this message in Switzerland. Both go hand in hand. Please remember. Go. He doesn't say stay. What does he say? Go. But we want him to say, stay. He said, that's another time. There's a time where I will say, stay. Now I tell you, go. And sin? 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 Deal with sin in our lives. Today let us look at the other influences that brought the woman and the accusers and all of us to the feet of Jesus. These are the influences which are probably outside of us. We looked last week at the influences within us that bring us to the feet of Jesus for judgment. 
Now I want you to look at the influences outside. There are influences from above and there are influences from below. There are influences which are vertical and there are influences which are horizontal. We have gone through this over and over again, but I don't know why the Lord is telling me over and over again, this need to be. And I want you to, when you listen to the message, to get it carefully. The reason we deal with things, issues concerning life in the house of God is because the house of God has two purposes. One, it is a hospital. It is a, everybody who is here, including your pastor, is a patient. And Jesus is the heavenly physician. Two, it is a training house. Don't go out as a patient. Go out as a soldier. We may come here wounded by sin, wounded by iniquity, wounded by transgression. The heavenly physician walks and heals us so that we can go out and there is a battle that is taking place. And you need to be part of that battle. Whether you like it or not, you are part of that battle. So there are influences from the top, vertical. Remember, there are curses that operate over every man, woman and child's life because the first curses were pronounced by God over all mankind in the Garden of Eden. Hello, are you there? Every marriage on earth was short-circuited in the Garden of Eden. Every marriage doesn't begin with happy, maybe at the level of feelings, but every marriage begins with a curse. Your desire for shall be for your man. You will try to control him and she will try to control you. That's a curse over the marriage. You see it happening in every marriage. And until you get to know the trap you are in and get out of it, it starts operating over your life. Parenthood has been short-circuited. Especially to the mother, it is said, your entire process of bringing out a child will be painful. It is not only at delivery time. You can ask older mothers also. They are still grieving in their spiritual womb because the child did not turn out the way you wanted it to be. It was short-circuited. Your workplace is cursed. Anybody very happy at your workplace? You don't like your work, you do. Why? Because the ground was cursed. And what shall it produce? Thorns and everything under the sky is under a curse pronounced by God. But thank God, in Jesus, the curses are taken away. Where is it taken away? In Jesus. But get this picture right. Every believer thinks I am in Jesus, therefore the curses don't operate. It doesn't work that way. Did you see this window? I am saying it so those who hear on the net will know what I am doing. My hand is outside. Now supposing you throw a bucket of water over me, does my hand get wet? Now supposing they throw a water of water, a bucket of water over my hand, does my body get wet? So you escape the curses only which part of you is within Jesus. Did you get it? And most of us or all of us are not in Jesus completely. We are still struggling with truth. The only way you get into Jesus is when you replace your thinking and your imaginations with this and allow the spirit to guide you. Till then you work under the influence of the curse. Because curse is the man who leans on the strength of his arm. So there are vertical curses that operate, that's come. It's God has spoken it. It works on everybody. It works on everybody. So please don't look at those living in those palatial houses and thinking they are happy. You go there and you meet them, you will see they are not happy. I met a man long time back ago in, a, in my church in Bhutan. We were talking to him, we were having dinner together with a sister in that house. And then he gave me his card and I looked at his card and I looked, wow, this guy is big. I won't mention his name. I looked at his degrees. From Paris, Sorbonne, he had a degree. From Harvard, he had a degree. From Cambridge, he had a degree. And I said, wow, these are the three top universities in the world. And then I looked at him. He's one of the heirs, the sons, or one of the top business families in India. Like big ones, like the Tatars and Bernas, really big. And he had come there to kill himself. He had all the wealth in the life in, in the world. He had all the degrees which people crave for. He had everything. But one thing. If we were to walk beside his house and see him going in his Rolls Royce or whatever, and with his well, we said, this must be a very happy man. 
But he had come there as a tourist to kill himself. But God in his mercy brought him through a sister who believed, so who invited him for dinner and called me to minister to him. And he went back without killing himself. So please do not think that the people you see and the news you hear, those people are happy. They're not happy. Tiger Woods isn't happy at all. They're not happy. So please remember, everybody operates. And vertical curses are even more defined in Deuteronomy chapter 28. It's defined very clearly. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, we are not going to look at that chapter, 15 verses are given for blessings. And what is that God says? If it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all these commandments which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. So first thing God says about blessings is don't follow them. Did you get it? Meaning don't go for prosperity gospel teachings. You don't have to. You just obey me. It will come upon you and overtake you. Did you get it? So you don't have to go for blessing conferences. It's given to you if you obey him. Fifteen verses for blessings. How many verses for curses? Fifty-two. He says, that will also follow you and overtake you. You don't have to seek that. If you don't, obey me. And it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, your God, to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. They will also overtake you. You can't run, outrun them. Did you see? This is God. These are things from the top, vertical. He is spoken. It shall be. And we get into Jesus, we start escaping them. Praise God for that. So what are the vertical ones? The only way I can escape this is being in Jesus. Second Peter chapter 1 verses 3 and 4. That's what Peter is talking about. Peter is talking about escaping this. So that we can, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life. What is that? Blessings and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through this you may be partakers of what? Or partakers of what? The divine nature. He says partake of that. I have to be in Jesus. So get into Jesus and into Jesus the curses start dropping over my life. They start falling away because in Jesus all the curses were taken by him. He become partakers of the continuous, constant partakers of Christ Jesus. Yet scripture says, if you disobey, the curses will start operating. And the vertical curses pronounced over by God, you will see from in Deuteronomy chapter 27. We look, we look today, hold on to your seats, fasten your seat belts, and... We will come from verse 15 of 27. You see? Yet, if you disobey God, says, Cursed is the one who makes a carved or molded image, an abomination to the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsman, and sets it up in secret. And all the people shall say, All the people shall say, You said Amen. You said Amen. Now whether you said Amen or not, <laughs> it works. So what is God saying? God saying, idolatry is forbidden. Worshipping of idols is forbidden. Whether it is a secret idol in your heart or a visible idol outside, whether the one you bow before is Mary, Jude or Ganesh, you are cursed. You are cursed. You are cursed. He says, covetousness is idolatry. If you are a covetous person, you are operating under a curse. We will not see the, if, the actual real effects of the curse on our lives until death takes place. You could end up in the wrong place. 
You do not know the actual effects of what it is, the full, complete effect of these things. So be very careful. Do not worship. If there are Catholics sitting here today, please not bow, keep an idol or worship Mary or any of the saints because God says it is an abomination to me. Mary was a sinner just like us. And the last word of Mary in the Bible is in Acts chapter 1 and verse 14. That the last time Mary is mentioned in the entire Bible. And you know what? She's obeying Jesus. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women. And Mary the mother of Jesus with his brothers. What? What did Jesus tell all of them? Do not leave Jerusalem. Wait in Jerusalem until you have received power. And when you receive power, you shall be my witnesses. Who told that to Mary? Who told that to Mary? Jesus, not her son. Jesus, the recent one who was God from everlasting to everlasting. Who was her God and her father. Not the son of her womb. That was only for 33 and a half years. This is the one who created her, told her, wait there in Jerusalem, in one accord with my brothers, with my apostles, and pray. Do not bow, do not worship, you run into trouble. There is a word called teraphim in the Hebrew Bible, which is called household gods. These are the gods which Rebecca stole, sorry, Rachel stole from her father, household gods. We all have household gods. We all have household gods. You know, that's why Jesus said, if any man does not hate his father, mother, wife, children, brother, sister, you cannot be my disciple. Because these are the household gods that keep us from following Jesus. The gods of our house. For many, it is your family and you are in trouble. For many, it is a pursuit of knowledge, education. Do you know psychiatrist hospitals are full of people with PhDs? I'm not kidding. Full of PhDs. Why? You pursue something without keeping God at the top. That's where you will end ultimately. Education is not your goal. Our goal is to know him more and more each day. He is our goal. So be very careful. Do not put career as an idol. What about your job? A lot of people are still relying on their job to bring them provision. And to give them a good life. Jeremiah chapter 17 verses 5 to 8. Sorry, 5, yeah, 5 to 8. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is a man who trusts in man and makes what? Flesh his strength. You have, put your, 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 you have put your trust in your manager to give you a promotion. So now you are working as a slave under him. Not serving God. Or you are putting your trust in your abilities and your job to sustain you. God says you are cursed. What did God say? What did God say you are? It's a vertical curse pronounced over your job. It's a curse pronounced from home. He says, you serve that, you are cursed. On the other hand, what does he say? Further down, what does he say? For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the past places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. And come down, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. And for he shall be like what? A tree planted by waters which spreads out its roots by the river. And it will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaf will be green. Do you, a man, do you know a man at the age of 40? It's written about him in the book of Acts chapter 7 verse 22. This is a man who leaned on the strength of his flesh. Who was this? What does it say about him? Moses. What does it say? Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Was mighty in words and... This is what? Who is this? Moses at the age of... 40. So he leaned on the strength of his flesh. What did he do? He killed the Egyptians. He, what did he do? He did not look to the left or to the right. Instead, no, he looked to the left and the right. He did not look up. And he killed an Egyptian. And what happened to him for the next 40 years? He lived in a parched land. He lived in a parched land. Literally, life was taken out of him. Did he have a home? Yes. Did he have food? Yes. Did he have a wife? Yes. Did he have children? Yes. Did he enjoy his life? No. Because he leaned on the strength of his hand. Yet, at the age of 80, God comes to him, restores him, 
And I want you to read Deuteronomy, the last chapter, 34 and verse 7. 34, Deuteronomy 34 and verse 7, that's the last chapter. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural vigor. Did you hear that? He's like a tree planted on the riverside, bearing fruit even in his old age. Why? Now he has stopped leaning on the strength of his flesh. Move from cursing to bless, blessing. From a cursed person to a most blessed person in the Old Testament. God is saying, be very careful. These are our household gods, our job, our family, our education. What about sport? Today's current fascination. There are believers who fast and pray for their teams to win. I'm not kidding. Before the TV, oh, let such not get out, such not get out, don't not get out, such not get out. They won't spend five minutes praying for the salvation in the world. Idols. Come to 27, back again. We have looked at that quite a bit. Let's just briefly go through it again. Verse 16. Cursed is the one who treats his father or his mother with contempt. And all the people shall say, some are being very careful now. <laughs> yeah. It's already been spoken. God says, don't dishonor your father and your mother. If you do that, you will run into. You think this, was hap this happened only after the law was given? No. Why was Jacob scared to, to do what his mother told him to do? Why did Jacob say, Mama, if I am, I am Jacob, he sees so. And you know, I look different. If I go and fool my father, the curse will come upon me. Was the law given then? The law wasn't given then, but he knew. He knew. So God says, be careful. Be very careful. Since we have dealt with this in the previous messages, we will move to the next one. The next one. Verse 17 and 18 and 19 comes under one grouping. Cursed is the one who moves the neighbor's landmark. And all the people shall say, Oh, thank God, we are all in the city working in IT companies. Therefore, have you taken credit for the work which you didn't do and what somebody actually else did in your company? Or run down an employee when he was hard working and you were not and then you take away all the promotion and the incentives when you actually did not do that work. You moved the landmark of your neighbor. Thinking that by running him or her down before your evaluator or your manager, you could rise. God says, I marked you that day. I marked you that day. That's what happens in all offices. That's what people do. And the next one. Verse 19. Cursed is the one who makes the blind to what? Wander of the? Wander of the? Do you do that? Do you do? Do you make the blind wander? You see a blind man standing and you say, just cross the road. You tell it. There is no traffic there cross. And all the buses are coming. Do you do that? But when you know that the day of the Lord is very near and judgment is coming and hellfire is ready. Do you actually by the way you live in your offices make the ones who do not know Jesus fall? Are you making the blind wander off the road? You are the one on the road, the narrow road. You know the way, you know the truth. You know this is the way, the only way to heaven. And you are making the blind wander off by the lifestyle you choose to live where God says, I put you there as my servant. I put you there. I put you there. I hear testimonies all the time from young people who refuse to pay bribes to the policemen. And the policeman says, there are very few people like you. Because they need to know, there are very few people like you. Oh, you want me to pay a bribe? If you want to pay, I will pay the fine, but give me a challah. I will go 20 times to the government office, but I will not pay a bribe. I don't want. I don't want anything that will stand against me on that day. It will cost you. To follow Jesus is not very easy. It will cost you. But we don't want to do those things. Because we have heard a gospel by saying that, come to Jesus, you will go to heaven. 
God says, no, you have to deal with sin in your life. I will forgive you now, but as you are walking, I will tell you sin no more. Sin no more. And then, what's the next thing that says? Curse is the one who perverts justice due the stranger, the fatherless and the widow. And all the people shall say, all the people shall say, we may not meet that many, though we have many orphans in our, in our church, the kids have all gone on vacation. But let me tell you, most of the maids I meet are either widows or orphans who work in our houses. Hello, all sisters. Most of the maids who work in our houses are either orphans or widows. And God says, do not withhold justice from them. Do not withhold justice from them. I am watching. I am watching. You know why? Because it says, you were all slaves in Egypt one day. And I did not withhold justice from you. Now that I am taking you into a land of plenty, you be careful to deal with others like you. With justice. Give them. Don't ask. Don't worry. Don't worry about the 10 rupees, 15 rupees, 20 rupees extra he or she asks. It doesn't make any difference to you. But God says it will make a difference to you on the day you stand before me. And the garbage collector. Don't fight over with him for that 5 rupees, 6 rupees. Don't. Don't. Don't withhold justice from these people. They struggle. You need to hear their stories before you will know what, what they actually go through. It's heart-rending some of their stories. I told you, a couple of months back, my garbage was piling it and I was getting a little irritated. Where is this Satyama? She's not turning up, turning up, turning up, turning up. One day I was walking, I saw another MCS sweeper cleaning. So I asked her, where is Satyama? She said, Sir, Jumeka, then she crossed the road. She got hit by two guys on a bike, she died. And I was getting upset about my garbage. Today her husband comes, old man comes. And are you going to bargain with him? Now the only way he lives is by the few houses from where he can get 30 rupees, 50 rupees for collecting the garbage. God says, do not withhold justice, do not withhold justice, do not withhold justice. And the next one, let us look at Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3. Another curse pronounced by Jesus. Verse 3, the Lord said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. Now you let me ask you, I got a mobile in my hand, okay. This is my mobile? You agree? My daughter will not agree. She said you took it forcibly from me. But it's my mobile, okay. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I can choose to give it to anybody I want. You can give it to Rani. You're going to object? She never. The others won't. You can give it to Justin. I can give it to anybody. Please remember this. Do not form your opinions based on liberal newspapers and news magazines. The land of Israel belongs to Israel. It doesn't belong to the Palestinians. The land of Israel was given to them as an eternal covenant by the God who owns the earth. He said, I have given to you as an eternal covenant. It belongs to no man. Anybody who tries to claim it is a squatter, and squatters don't have rights before God. But people, Christians, are forming opinions based on news channels and papers, and they are against the Jews, and they are saying Jerusalem should be divided. Do you think Jerusalem will, God will allow Jerusalem to be divided? It's the holy city of His Son forever and ever. But we sit there in circles and we discuss about the Jewish atrocities against the Palestinians, which is not true, because that land belongs to them. You curse them, God says you will be cursed. Because they are the seed of Abraham. Anyone who blesses Abraham is blessed. Anyone who curses Abraham is cursed. And without thinking to look good in academic circles, Christians sit together and make comments without realizing there are vertical forces that operate over your life because Israel belongs to them. It doesn't belong to you and to me. It belongs to them. It was given to them. So please remember, when we form our opinions, it is based on truth. Another one, Zechariah chapter 5, verses 1 to 3. Then I turned and raised my eyes and saw there a flying scroll. And he said to me, what do you see? So I answered, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits and its width is 10 cubits. 
and then is said to me, this is the curse. What is this? This is a pronounced by God that goes out over the face of the whole earth. Every thief shall be expelled according to this side of the scroll. Every perjurer shall be expelled according to this side of it. Every thief shall be expelled. Are you a thief? No, Pastor, I am not a thief. Are you sure? It's very difficult to find an honest man. Every guy you meet is a thief. You go to the auto driver, his thing is, his meter goes faster than your heartbeat. <laughs> Whether whatever his religion may be, he may have a sticker at the back, Jesus saves, but you want salvation when you are sitting in his auto. <laughs> yeah. What about your plumber? What about your plumber? Is he honest when he gives you that bill for the work he does? The electrician, he will make it in such a way that the first time you put it on, it will blow, so you have to call him back again. Every one profession you think about is stealing. There are honest men and women of God in between all this. What about teaching? Are you really doing an honest day's work in your classroom? Are you really honestly doing what God, that you would be able to stand before God and say, Lord, I have done justice in your eyes, the way I teach to my students. I am not a strict who keeps enters when the bell rings and leaves when the bell rings and I will always strictly deal with subject. Does your life itself reflect to these children that there is a way to heaven? I'm telling you, God says there are lots of thieves around. Lots and lots of thieves around. Bankers, will they ever tell you the full truth? Though they will swear to tell you the whole truth, will they ever tell you? The carpenter, the mason, the doctors. Doctors? If you don't die of your disease, you will die by the price of the medicines they prescribe. Isn't it true? And they usually fleece the poor ones. The poor ones are the fleeced. I look at the maids and the people coming and I said, what does this cost you? Sir, Dawai Dej, your doctor, it is 70 rupees for a tablet. I said, how can they do to this man? He won't do it with me. Because I know that this child needs only crossing. But he will prescribe the most expensive medicines for the poor and they do not know. And who are these? Who went to medical college, got an MBBS and an MD and is a thief. God says he's a thief. And God says there is a curse. A day is coming, every thief will be expelled. Every thief will be expelled. God is saying, what about you? We work in good places, IT companies, other companies. He says, do you steal anything from your employer? Do you know you are serving me? Do you steal anything? Are you accountable? Then let's go to another one. Malachi chapter 3 verses 8 to 9. And Hebrews 7, 8. First Malachi chapter 3 verses 8 to 9. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have you robbed you? In tithes and? He says, you have stolen from me in tithes and offering. You are cursed with a? What is this? You are cursed with a? For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. You have robbed me, he says. So what happens? There is a curse operating over your life. Now you don't tell me tithes is Old Testament. Jesus still, look at the Pharisees, learn from them. Your righteousness should exceed that of the Pharisees. How did he tithe? He tithe so regularly of his cumin seed and his mustard seed, his haldi, his dhania, everything he tithe. He said your righteousness should exceed that of it. Now come to Hebrews 7 and verse 8. Here, mortal men, that's me, mortal men receive, but there he, who is receiving it? He's receiving it. You may see only me taking it and place, he says, it's his hands, don't look at his hands. Up there, I am receiving your tithes so that I can release the blessing into your lives. Don't look at mortal flesh. Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, oh it is witness that he lives. He's talking about Melchizedek, and Jesus is the Melchizedek. He receives it there. So be very, very careful. Do not bring influences into your life which will one day bring us to his feet. And then, this many, we'll stop with that. These are vertical curses that come from above. Then there are curses which are not from the heaven of God, where he is quite a bit lower. 
This is when we join hands with the enemy and pronounce curses over our lives. Balak joined with Balaam. What did he say? Curse the people. Curse the people. Now we join with the enemy and we start cursing others. And we bring curses upon other people. We are just talking about joining hands with the enemy. Do you remember? Satan is called the accusers of God's brethren. What is he called? Accusers of God's brethren. You may have a problem with your brother. God has got all parameters of how to deal with it. He said deal with it, deal with other level of issues and back off. Back off. If he doesn't listen, back off. Go out. But if you become an accuser of the brethren and you pronounce a curse, what happened to Balaam? He died peacefully in his sleep. Is that what is written? Did he wish for a peaceful death? Yes, he said, I want to die the death of a righteous. Did he die the death of a righteous? No. What happened? But did he say anything against Israel? No. Whatever he opened his mouth, he was blessing them. What was in his heart? Curses. God controlled his tongue. But God read and judged him by his heart. And he died the death of a unrighteous, slaughtered, and Israel entered. Then, Proverbs 18.21. Horizontal curses. Okay. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its God has said, I have said before you, blessing and curses, life and death, you choose. And what do we choose? Often we choose death by choosing to curse horizontally. Do we? Genesis chapter 9 verses 24 to 26. Yes. So Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. And then he said, Curse be Canaan. A servant of servants he shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servants. Uh, technically speaking, historically speaking, I don't know how true it is, they say all people of black origin are Canaanites and all people of white origin are Shemites. If that is true, it's still working. Shem, Semitic origin. Because we know only about the Jews, which is one tribe, two tribes. The rest of them are dispersed, unknown. But a father cursed a grandson and his progeny. And God held it true. God didn't change it. He told the Israelites, when you enter into Canaan, put to death every Canaanite. Father, mother and child. He upheld that curse. Horizontal curse. So we be careful as parents what you say and speak over your children. Do not discipline your children in anger. Do not discipline your children in anger because you may end up saying the things which you are not supposed to say. Genesis 31 verses 30 to 32. Another curse. Third, no, 31, not 13. 30, 3, 0, 30 to 32. Jacob is on the way back. He is the husband. He is running from Laban's house. And now he has surely gone because you greatly long for Yah. Come down, why did you steal my gods? Laban is asking. Then Jacob answered and said, to Laban, because I was afraid for you said, perhaps you take your daughters from me by force. With whomever you find your gods, do not let him live. In the presence of your brethren, identify what I have yours and take it with you. For Jacob did not know that Rachel had... Did it make any difference that Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen? No, but as a husband, he pronounced a curse over Rachel and Rachel died. Rachel... So you have to be very careful. As husbands, do not pronounce curses over your wife. As wives, do not pronounce curses over your husband. Instead, what does God say? Submit to one another. Not curse one another. Bless one another. There are influences that work over our lives. 
Genesis 35 verses 16 to 18. They journeyed from Bethel and when there was but a little distance to go, Rachel labored in childbirth and she had hard labor. Now it came to pass when she was in hard labor, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, you will have this son also. And so it was, her soul was departing. For she, what happened to her? She, and what did she say? That she called his name, Ben, what is that? And his father called him, the father realized, immediately got it. What the mother named the son? Son of my trouble. What did the father say? No, son of my right hand. But this has operated over the tribe of Benjamin till today. The curses pronounced by the mother, the blessing pronounced over the father. Son of my trouble. What did the Lord say? Did Jacob say, son of my right hand. First Samuel chapter 9 verses 1 and 2. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zerod, the son of Bekorah, the son of Aphiah, Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a choice and handsome son whose name was? Was he a man of the right hand? Yes, he was a mighty man. But was he also a man of trouble? Yes. It was from the tribe of Benjamin. Just two examples I am giving you. Philippians chapter 3 verses 4 to 7. Philippians chapter 3 verses 4 to 7. Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. Philippians chapter 3 verses 4 to 7. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Why? Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of? From the tribe of? Who is this? St. Paul. A Hebrew of the Hebrews concerning the law of Pharisee. Was he a man of trouble? Yes, he created enough trouble. And then, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted. He knew how to escape the curse. So he said, I am dead in Christ. It doesn't, won't affect me anymore. So he's the most blessed man. We know in history. Because he realized the way to get out of it is get into Christ. Nothing will operate over my life. Amen. Genesis chapter 27 verses 11 and 12. The other kind of curse which we do. Lot of people, especially women in India, do this regularly. It's like daily meditation for them. Genesis chapter 27 verses 11 and 12. And Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, Look, Esau my brother is a hairy man and I am a smooth skinned man. Perhaps my father will feel me and I shall be a deceiver to him and I shall bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. And Verse the next one, verse 13. What did his mama say? What did his mother say? His mother said to him, let your curse be on me, my son. Let your, now this is self-imposed curses. You do that ladies, oh I am cursed from the day I was born. Why should I have been born? I should have died in my birth. My husband has left me. They are always pronouncing curses upon themselves. Look back and check your words. This one she let your curse be upon me. Did it happen? Did it happen? Yes, it did happen. Did she see Jacob later? Never. She died before Jacob never came back. We pronounce curses upon ourselves. Curses upon ourselves. God says don't do that. Don't do that. People are cursing themselves over and over and over and they say, this is my fate. Does God anywhere say, this is your fate? He says, no, I have got plans for you. Plans to prosper you and give you hope and a future. This is, but he will not listen. God says he will not listen. You are always pronouncing curses. And then, Proverbs 28 and verse 9. Beware. One who turns away his Ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. Did you know that? He says, if you don't obey my voice, when you pray, your prayer is an abomination to me. And we think, Lord, why are you not hearing me? He said, you are not listening to what I am trying to tell you. I have been speaking to you week after week, month after month, year after year. You are not listening to my voice and when you pray to me, your prayer is an abomination to me. 
We never thought prayers were abomination. We thought everything else was okay, but prayer is holy always because I'm praying to God. God says, no. If you disobey my voice and then pray, the prayer is an abomination to me. Church, we need to be very careful because God's got a great purpose for everybody. He's got a crown for everybody. He says, please don't lose it. Don't lose it. Because what did he tell the woman? Go, sin, no more. Romans 14, 23. Last part of verse 14, 23. Let's leave the eating bit. But eating is very important for us. God says, even when you eat, he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is... Ah... Whatever is not, definition for sin in the world, definition for sin in the house of God is different. Whatever is not of faith is sin. You ask yourself, the last seven days, did whatever you do, did it come from faith? Faith comes from hearing, hearing the word of God. You will not know what is sin unless you know this. Because this is from where faith comes. Faith comes from God's word, not from anywhere else. There are, that's a different kinds of faith. But the real living faith is from the word of God. And whatever is not from the faith is sin. So what, that's what I said. God's people have only excuses. They don't have the reasons. Excuses is picked from all of information from the world. No, pastor, I couldn't do that. And I couldn't do, Lord, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. God says there is it's a lie. Because your answers don't come from this. Because... For a man who believes there is nothing that is impossible. Doesn't God say that? You have no excuses. You have no excuse. Whatever is not of faith is sin. And what did he tell her? Go sin not. And then what happens to us? We start struggling. Proverbs 24.10 and Psalm 78.9 and 10. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is? Are we failing in the day of adversity? Your strength is small. Why is our strength so small? Why is it some people are able to take pressure after pressure after pressure after pressure, while others, the little wind blows, they already crumbled and fallen? Because your strength is small. Your strength is small. That's a trip question I always ask. Who is the strong man who has withstood temptation? The sinner or the saint? Who has experienced the power of temptation? The sinner or the saint? The saint. The sinner hasn't experienced the real power of temptation. He has already fallen when the first temptation came. That's why scripture says Jesus was tempted at all points but did not sin. You couldn't push him down with one, you couldn't push him with two, so the enemy is increasing the strength of temptation over Jesus' life, the way we will never experience, and he's not falling. But if you faint in the day of adversity, that means your strength is very small. Psalm 78 verses 9 and 10. The children of Ephraim being armed and carrying bows, turn back in the day of battle. That's what happens to most believers. He said, I have given you, I give you authority. To trample on scorpions. These signs shall follow those who believe. What will happen? Demons will come out. Sick will be healed. People will believe. But what happens? They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law. Therefore, even though they had bows and arrows, they turned away from the battle. Bows and arrows are given by God. But it's up to you whether you want to stay in the battle or turn away. They turned away from the battle. And child, children, church, this is the day of battle. This is the day for which the whole of creation was waiting for. We have come to that age. The final battle. And God says, your enemy should define you or will define you. Whether you are strong or whether you are going to run. Do you know that without a Pharaoh there would be no Moses? Moses is defined by his enemy, by Pharaoh. Without Ahab and Jezebel, there is no Elijah. And God was angry because he wanted to finish Elijah to finish Jezebel. And Elijah ran away from that. So it went over, the job went over to Jehu and Elisha. Can you imagine about a David without King Saul? David was defined by his enemy. Can you imagine about a Esther rising up and me knowing without a Haman? God says, stop making excuses. Because some of you have just given up. 
not just here, those who hear also. Some of you have drawn boundaries around yourself and says, this is as far I will go with God, I stay here, you stay out. That's what Israel also did, they limited God. Some of you have household gods. And some of you have limited God by fear. You are always afraid to take a step towards God. And God says in Revelation 21 verse 8, the fearful will not enter into heaven. Don't take it lightly. It's very serious. If God says the fearful will not enter into heaven, let me tell you the fearful will not enter into heaven. Because it's God's word. 21.8 And if you're always afraid to step out for God, step out when he tells you, and you're afraid because you're most scared of losing things in the world, he says, you will not enter. The cowardly will not. And what's the last one? And all? 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 Shall we repeat that word? Because we like that word. We practice it daily. What is that? So he says, we leave the rest in between. That all we know. Adulterers and almost all that we know. Leave that. The first two. Cowardly and liars. Almost everybody falls into that. God says, you will not enter. It's God's word. He cannot change it. He's already spoken. So God says, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. That's why grace is given to overcome this. You know why many of us are living long? Because he's giving us to put right things. He says, put right, put right, put right. But this is what has to happen in the last. That is why he says, in the last days, before his coming, Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5, who will come? Who will come? The last. Behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. And all, verse 5, verse 5, verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and the dreadful day of the... And you see that happening around the world. The spirit of Elijah is moving and it's not a call to blessing and health and healing. It's a call to repentance. That's what Elijah does. The entire ministry of Elijah was to call Israel back to repentance. Come. What does Elijah say? If Jehovah is God, follow Jehovah. If Baal is God, follow and what does God tell the last day's church in the book of Revelation? If Jehovah is God, be hot. If Baal is God, be cold. Don't be lukewarm. I'll spew you out of your mind, my mouth. The same word gone to the last day's church. Either be hot on fire for me or be cold. Either follow Jehovah or follow Baal. If you are lukewarm, I'll spew you out. I will spew you out. And that's what the call of Elijah went. The last day's church, the Laodicean church in Revelation chapter 3 is talking about us. He says, either be on fire or follow Baal. If you are lukewarm, he says, I'll spew you out. There's no, there's no job function for lukewarm people in God's kingdom, he says. And that's exactly what uh, Elijah did. What did he tell them? Come near. First call was to come near. Second thing, what did he say? Repair the altar. And third one, pour. 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 You may have heard it often, but the same thing. What did he tell them to do? Pour. Pour what? Pour what? Pour what? Did he ask them to pour oil? Did he ask them to pour, bring their money? Bring their grain? What was happening in Israel for three and a half years? Why was the famine there? What was happening for three and a half years? What has been stopped? What is the most precious commodity in Israel? What does he tell them to do? How much water until the trench overflows? God says, this is what will happen when the real spirit of God hits you. You will come, you will repair your life and you will pour out your whole life on the altar. And that's what Paul is saying. And my life is being poured out like a living sacrifice there. It will happen. It will happen. It is happening. It is happening. It will happen. We all read about the great Azusa revival and all. But you know how it happened? It happened because there were men who said, put their head in orange crate boxes and refused to come out until the spirit of God moved. They said, here we are. We are going, now we are going to get up. Young people stood against the walls for six months together, crying and weeping as the spirit of God fallen them. And even if you go today, you will see streams that have flown from their eyes because it has left marks on. And then how many millions came to the Lord? Because those were people who were saying, Lord, we want, we want, we want. We will not move. We are, we are tired of this. We want you, we want you. That's when the fire comes. That's when Elijah could bring the fire. But if we are thinking about other things, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. 
God is looking for people who will be serious with him and not look at my problem, my family problem and wife's problem and brother's problem and say that, forget it all. There's a purpose and there is a king. Do you think any soldier in the army can say that my wife is ill so I can't come to the battlefield? Do you know how many soldiers I know when I was working with the army that they went halfway for the vacation and gets a telegram to come back and they come back? Because a soldier when he recruits into the army, he's on call 27, 20, 365 days a year, 24-7. I have been in army barracks when I used to minister as a chaplain where we enter into a mess, we, the, the, the driver brings his sheet, we get into the mess, we put the sheet over there and I sit in one bench, they sit on the other bench, it's an altar, we start praying, the spirit of God hits, they are crying, they are weeping, the worship is going on, one call, he says, by pastor, the sheet is gone, his gun is on, his uniform is gone, he's immediately gone. The whole thing took only 10 minutes. Do you think the spirit of God misses 10 minutes? No, he is there. But they know what they are, they are on call. And God says, you are on call, I am on call. We are soldiers in the army. And he says, there is, there is a master and there is a king. And it's coming to the end. We are coming to the end of the battle. And we are still thinking about issues which are irrelevant to the kingdom. Irrelevant, absolutely, totally irrelevant to the kingdom. We are not pouring our lives before God and says, Lord, here I am, here I am, here I am. This, the fire is gone. In our lives, fire is gone. And Elijah says, there is a God and there is fire. It's only when fire has fallen, then blessing should come. The blessing should be a result of the fire of God. Once the fire has gone, he calls his servant and says, go look, the blessings are coming. The servants will go and say, Sir, I don't see anything. He says, go again. I don't see anything, go again. I don't see again, go again. But what is Elijah doing? Elijah said, okay, I will also come with you. Did he say that? What is Elijah doing? Elijah is on his knees with his head between there. Because he is seeing with his spirit what the servant can't see with his eyes. And all those servants of God who are on their knees before God in the spirits are seeing the hand of God is rising over this world. And it is not the hand of blessing, it is the hand of judgment. It's coming. And he's telling his house, judgment begins in my house. Please put your house in order. Put your life in order. Do not be get caught in that. Put your life in order, put your life in order, put your life in order. Let there be passion. Because he is not coming, let me use the terrible word from the pulpit. He is not coming for a whore, he is coming for a bride. Are you getting it? If your heart is in the world, God says you are a whore. Because you are going after other lovers, that's what he said in the book of Hosea. You have gone after other lovers, I am coming for a bride. Who is prepared, separated, sanctified herself, looking for the bridegroom to come. He is coming for a bride. It's not coming for anybody else. And if you are not prepared and ready as the bride, let me tell you, when the last trumpet falls, blows, you won't be there in that call. You will not hear. Only the bride will hear. Only the bride will hear. That's why when Eliezer came and the family said, Rebecca said, I'll go tomorrow. I've been prepared for this day. All my life I was prepared and ready for this day. And God is asking, where are you? Where are you? Don't look at your family troubles and all those things. None of these things are reasons. Moses' wife gave him so much trouble. That's why she and the sons are not counted there in the history. Are they counted? No. Samuel's wife and children are not counted. He was a great man. His wife and children gave him trouble. He's not, they are not counted. Esther's husband was a rank unbeliever. Is he counted? He is not counted. So don't look at this. It's common to everybody. None of this should stop you from following God. Because I'm telling you because there are so many of you having family troubles. That shouldn't stop you from serving the living God. All around you testimony could be terrible. Nobody is following the God. But in the midst of iniquity and sin, there was a little boy, maybe four or five years old, when God spoke, he heard. The high priest didn't hear. Because his mother had taught him in the spirit how to hear. And he heard. And he needed to find that. Because Jesus is saying, go. He did not say stay. He says, go. And do not Sin. Luke chapter 5 verse 14. Quickly. To the leper he said, go and tell. Go and tell. He asked him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering. But Jesus says, go. Luke 8 verse 48. This is the leper. And he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. To one he says, go. 
to the priest. Second, he says, go in peace. And Luke chapter 10 and verse 37, to the expert in, in the law, what did he tell him? 37. Quickly, Vijay. What did he say? Go and do likewise. What is that? Show mercy. The good Samaritan showed mercy. It's the parable of the good Samaritan. He says, you also go and show mercy. And then, to the woman caught in adultery, what did he say? Go and sin. And Mark 10, 16 and verse 4, 15, what does he tell us? Go. Mark 16, verse 15, what does he say? Go into all the world and preach thee. And Mark 28, verse 19, what did he say? It's not enough that you preach the gospel, but also you need to... No. Matthew 28, verse 19. What did he say? Go, therefore, and make disciples. This is to be in the go. Go, go, preach, make disciples. Once you have fulfilled the purpose, he closes the Bible with Revelation 22, verse 17. He closes the canon. He says, when you have gone, listen to my voice, listen to my word, and gone. Then what he says? He says, come. What does he say? Come. And the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who hears say, come. Let him who thirsts, come. Who desires, let him take the water of life freely. He says, all you who denied yourself in this world for the sake of the king and the kingdom, you come now. And drink freely. It's not now he's saying come, now he's saying go. He's saying go. There is a day when we will hear, come, come, well done and faithful, servant, enter into my joy. It's very difficult when you go out to remember the message. Because once you get out of that this thing, there will be so many temptations who will tell you, come. You don't have to wait till that day. You don't have to wait till that day. You don't have to wait till that day. Come, come. When you look, you should look only when God tells when you turn, you should only turn when God tells. You need to be very clear when you are in God. There are things which you can do, which others can't do. He told Lot and his wife and his children, don't look back. Does it say? Did they look back? Somebody looked back? What happened to her? But do you know, he said, don't look back at Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you know in the same passage it is written that Abraham was looking over Sodom and Gomorrah, nothing happened to him? He was watching the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. But there was no Sodom and Gomorrah in his heart. The one who came out, when they looked back, they were destroyed. So God is saying, remain under that covering. Remain under that protection. Remain under that protection. Destruction won't come to you. It won't touch you. A thousand may fall at your one hand, right hand, left hand, a thousand, ten thousand on the other, but it will not come near. If any of your wife perishes, praise God, what can you do? You can't save her, only God can save her. If your husband perishes, you can't do anything, only God can save him. If your children perish, only God can save them. You can pray, you can intercede, you can witness, you testify, but only God saves. No man has ever saved his wife, only God can save his wife. But let me tell you, the day you die, or in the twinkling of an eye when it takes place, you stand alone before your God. Not even if your wife is a believer, she doesn't stand by you. The relationship stops then. You stand before God, not as the husband of him or the wife of that. You stand God as a person for all eternity. That is your identity. You are not a husband or a father or a mother. That is why Jesus said, anyone who loves me, has to turn his back to all this. He's not saying to dishonor them or anything. He says, you need to put it right. Whenever you have to make this choice, put it right. I come first. That's a disciple. That's those who will enter into heaven and be overcomers and receive crumbs. Not the others who complain and gripe and complain and gripe and vacillate and move backwards. God says, no. You may get saved. You may enter in just through the flames. There's nothing reserved for you and me there if we enter that way. So we saw the things that was inside that brought that woman to that feet of Jesus. Now we saw things that are outside that brought, brings us to the feet of Jesus. And to both God says, go and sin no more. Shall we stand up?
David Wilkerson was writing about some town in US where they just a man touched by the spirit of God just an ordinary man who is standing there and preaching and tens and hundreds of people are turning to Christ everywhere it is happening everywhere it's not great theological pundits or anybody it's simple men and women touched by the fire of God standing there on the streets and preaching and people are turning because it's happening it's happening like never before the falling away and the gathering and when that happens wake up you shouldn't be caught in the long, wrong group and you should have the courage to get on your knees before God and say Lord here I am it's not that you can't but many are scared Many are counting that cost and many are making without realizing secret deals with the enemy by withholding what truly belongs to God. Your life belongs to God. Your time belongs to God. Your commitment belongs to God. Your everything belongs to God. But you think, I worked so hard, I have reached this position. If I ask God, He will take this away from me. Therefore, you are holding back. God says, don't do that. Anyone who finds his life will lose it. Anyone who loses his life for my sake will find it. God is never constrained by us. If he doesn't find me, he'll find somebody else. And there was nobody to speak his word. He found a donkey who brought a prophet to his knees. And there was nobody to speak to an apostle. He got a rooster to speak to him. Don't think that if I say no, God's work will stop. It won't. He'll find somebody who will say yes. If Mary had said no, he would have raised another Mary or a Jane or a Elizabeth who would have said yes. God is never limited by my nose. I lose, you lose. He never loses. Because he already knows all those who are his. Amen. Shall we pray? Father, we stand before thee, O God. It's your word. It's your word. And the time has come for everybody, Lord, who is in the army, to stand up and to be counted. Not in works. More than works about to get on their knees in intercession. Very few are called to preach. All are called to pray. All are called to pray, Lord. And I believe, O oh God, as each one prays, they will find their destiny in you. They will find their purpose in you. Because you are a God who speaks. Who speaks clearly to his people. There is no confusion in you, O oh God. If there is confusion, it's only because we haven't sought your face, sought your voice. Because you speak. First you speak and tell us to deal with sin. Once we have dealt with sin, you tell us to go. Once we have gone, he tells us, as you go, sin no more. And then purpose is defined, O God. Purpose is defined. Every curse is broken in Christ Jesus. Help us to get deeper and deeper into the truth and into you. Yet while that is happening, not to forget the purpose we are here. To serve a king and a kingdom. We are servants. There are no rulers here yet. We are all servants serving a king. The king is coming one day. The scripture says he will settle accounts both with his servants and with his enemies. Father, I pray as we go from your house today, let your voice continue to convict us. From the oldest to the youngest, as it is written in that same passage, not to go away from you, but to allow your spirit to deal with us. Let us not be hard of hearing, dull of hearing, as the book of Hebrews says. Because we rejected your word, the book of Hebrews says, many of you have become dull of hearing. Let not that happen, God. Let there be a new word, a fresh word always for us from you. A fresh anointing to fulfill that word. Because you are a father who speaks to his children. Touch the ears of your people, God, with the blood of Jesus. That the hearing may be opened. That they may hear your voice. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you. We go into another week. It should be a week of revival. A real week of restitution. A week when we seek your face. And hear your voice. And find purpose. Thank you, Father. Thank you. For in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So may the grace of God. Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us. Amen. For all our sermons and Bible study messages, please visit us online at www.gracetabernaclehype.org I repeat 
www.gracetabernaclehyd.org